Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome to The Empowering Neurologist. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Sarah Gottfried. Dr. Gottfried is a Harvard and MIT uh, trained uh, physician and uh, educator. She is a nationally renowned speaker and she is also the author of two New York Times bestsellers including The Hormone Cure and The Hormone Reset Diet. Uh, these uh, are really exciting books that deal with uh, lifestyle interventions and their role in terms of changing uh, the activity of hormones within our bodies. Her new book, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, is called Younger, a breakthrough program to reset your genes, reverse aging, and turn back the clock 10 years. Uh, I've read this book and you will be very impressed uh, when you hear what she has to say. Uh, she has dedicated herself to helping women really feel at home uh, within their bodies uh, after graduating as a physician scientist from both Harvard and MIT. Dr. Gottfried completed her residency training uh, in OBGYN at the University of California in San Francisco. Uh, she is board certified in OBGYN, obstetrics and gynecology, and she runs the Gottfried Institute, which is a, uh, an enormously successful what we call virtual practice, and she's going to uh, tell us what that means. She has a bit of a what we call disruptive model of how to deliver cutting edge women's health to as many women as possible using current technology, including uh, teleseminars, group coaching, webinars, and social media to really reset and lengthen the health span. In other words, the length of time that a person can remain disease free, regardless of a person's age and using this technology, regardless of a person's location. She is what we call an integrative gynecologist, meaning that she's able to integrate into her therapeutic programs various somewhat alternative modalities. She's a firm believer in looking at and treating the root cause of problems and not just focusing on symptoms. She believes uh, in the fundamental importance of diet and uh, understanding uh, that the, her commentary is really made on the most well-respected peer-reviewed studies uh, that she reviews in uh, the writing of her book and in the creation of her seminars. You've probably seen Dr. Gottfried featured on a variety of other types of media. She's been in O Magazine, Real Simple, she's been written up in Cosmopolitan, Glamour, Family Circle, Natural Health, Women's World, Red Book, uh, Yoga Journal, and in addition she was in the award-winning film Yoga Women uh, again, uh, asked to be in that film because of her expertise. She's been on many well-respected television programs, including 2020, Fox News. Uh, she lives in Berkeley, California with her husband and her two daughters. And interestingly, in closing, and I wrote this in my blog as well, a great quote from Dr. Gottfried is, uh, I've had nearly every hormonal problem a woman can get. I've done the legwork and reviewed the studies exhaustively so you don't have to. So uh, let's just jump right into our interview. Well, hello, Dr. Gottfried. I am so delighted to chat with you today. Hi, David. So happy to be here. So uh, as I was talking about in the introduction, you've really worked at this for a long time. You are uh, in the business of empowering mostly women uh, in terms of giving them really great information and you know you, you've written some really incredible books. Your new book now that we're talking about, Younger, um, really is a kind of a, a different perspective in that you know we all grew up with the notion that our DNA was hardwired and it really was a one-way street. That was the code that determined pretty much everything about our health destiny. But uh, I think what your new book is all about is really challenging that notion in a very empowering and a very positive way. So how did that happen to you? What was the epiphany that got you going? Yeah, I had a few epiphanies actually. And the first one was an experiment that I never wanted. <laughs> it was a test of my telomeres. Telomeres are the little caps, as you know, on chromosomes that are a marker of how you're aging, the aging process. I was in my 40s, 44 to be exact. And I was interested in using telomere testing in my patients, but I felt like I needed to test myself before I launched into I doing this feeling. with 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm... And what I found when I tested myself was that my telomeres were 20 years older oh my than gosh. my chronological age. And that was such a shock because I felt like I took pretty good care of myself. I practiced yoga several times a week. I ate really well. But I, I just felt like there were some levers involved in aging that I wasn't aware of, and I needed to address them. And at the same time, I also I tested one of my first patients, and this was a woman who was 65, and her telomeres put her at a biological age of 45. So I knew that it was possible to kind of slow down this aging process. That's what galvanized me. So how wonderful that, uh, you know, uh, people look upon us and I, this is the way it is, thinking, oh gosh, we have all the answers, we're living the right lifestyle. But um, oftentimes we are surprised by things. And I think people who read my new book realized I had a, a, quite an event a year ago and, and it was a wake up a call for me as well. But let me just go back to the notion of telomeres for just a moment. So for our viewers, telomeres again are these caps on the ends of our genes that are really well correlated to what is called biological aging or a marker of biological aging. As we age, our telomeres tend to shorten and that makes our DNA more susceptible to being damaged. An enzyme called telomerase actually is involved in preserving and even lengthening uh, the telomeres. And I'm certain that Dr. Godfrey is gonna take us to that place right now. One of the cool things, for example, about vitamin D is that there's a really strong relationship between vitamin D status and the length of telomeres. So then here you are, you're working away and your uh, biological age is 20 years older than your calendar age. What does that do to you? Well, it sets me up for chronic disease in a way that I never appreciated. You know, I think a lot of us run around in our 30s and 40s not thinking about this arc that we're potentially on. So some of that is related to your genetics. I have an increased risk of blood sugar problems, for instance, and also a number of obesity genes. And I was lean at the time, but I, I think that I was turning on and off my genes in a way that was not serving me. So it puts me at a greater, greater risk of Alzheimer's disease, which also runs in my family. It puts me at a greater risk of certain types of cancer, including breast cancer. And... Um, and just a kind of a low level of inflammation, which is one of the, the metabolic costs of stress, um, that just got me to, to kind of pay attention in a whole new way. Can you tell us what genetic testing you did? How did you go about getting genetic testing? Well, I started genetic testing when it first became available directly to consumers because I felt like this was something that, you know, my patients might want to do. And, um, I wanted to understand some of the reporting that they got. So I started with um, a company that no longer is, is available, but it was Integrative Genomics, I believe. And um, I also had done, as an OBGYN, I'm a board certified gynecologist, I had done some testing um, in the realm of prenatal screening. I'm sorry, my voice is a little bit trashed. So I then started using 23andMe which I think is maybe the most affordable way to look at um, a number of the genes that we've gotten pretty informed about. I also, I never like to give just one lab. So um, another lab that I like a lot is Pathway, pathway.com, that you need to order, I believe, directly through a clinician that's involved with them. But, but those are some of the labs. Me. I mean, uh, that's you know, right. you just order it directly. And, and then you can learn. You know, what, what's really so exciting for people of my age, and you're a lot younger, but, you know, again, we were, it, it was ingrained in our, in our psyche that our genes were deterministic. And here you are saying that you had a gene that put you at risk for obesity and put you at risk for Alzheimer's. And, you know, this empowering message that you portray is that we can reduce those risks by making changes in our lifestyle. You know, that's really uh, leveraging this modern science. It's incredible. Totally agree. I think this is, the, this is the next 10 to 20 years of medicine. It's something that we've learned a lot about in the past decade. And it's, um, it provides a sacred opportunity 
because I think, you know, speaking for myself, when I went through medical school and my training, my residency training, we had this more fatalistic approach to, you know, you're stuck with the genes you have, but now we know you're not stuck with how your genes are expressed. So we have this opportunity to change the way we eat, the way we think, the way we supplement, the way that we move our bodies, the way we sleep so that we can turn on the right genes, turn off the wrong genes. So let's first start with what you did for yourself personally, and then we'll generalize that uh, for, I guess, mostly women in terms of the issues that, of the day that women in America are really concerned about. What did you f- do for yourself? Well, when I got this test at 44, I was a runner. Um, you know, I wasn't running, running long distances, but I would run four to five miles four days a week. That's, and, that's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was modest. It's what a working mother can fit in between all her other responsibilities. But what I learned, David, was that I'm someone who runs around with kind of a high set point with cortisol, the main stress hormone. In fact, when I first started this process, I found that my cortisol level, serum cortisol in the morning, was about three times what it should be. And running raises cortisol even further. So I needed to change the kind of exercise that I was doing. I needed to, of course, get to the root cause and address why my cortisol was so high. Um, so I, I started doing more adaptive exercise. I started to do Pilates, more yoga, and, um, and meditation became non-negotiable. Mm. So I meditate every mm. morning for 30 minutes. Way to go. That's, that's made a huge change. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday uh, as I was leaving the gym. Uh, if you're awake for 15 hours in a day, all and let's just say how much time do you spend eating? Everybody knows eating is important for your health. Uh, and if you add it up, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, is that an hour, an hour and a half? Fine. I'm asking for that length of time for uh, other things too, like exercise and meditation. Then you still left yourself 12 to 13 hours to do all your other stuff. So you made those changes in hopes of reducing some measurable parameters like cortisol. And what did you notice? Well, I graduated from couples therapy. I realized that my, my marriage was better when my cortisol was lower. Who knew? I, um, <laughs> who knew? I, it was actually, the problem was me. Um, my belly fat reduced. So, you know, I think the easiest way to measure that is just with an abdominal circumference, a waist circumference, and it started to go down. So that got me to pay more attention and um, the next thing I dialed in was food. So food, I think, you know, you talk about this in all of your books, about the lever of food and how crucial it is. And, you know, it goes back to the time of Hippocrates. So I, I realized that some of the foods I was eating were adding to my problem with stress hormones. So, you know, two to three cups of coffee every morning was not serving me well. It was robbing me of sleep. Um, and, uh, other things were creating inflammation in my body. We can get into those details if you want, you know, things like gluten and sure, other grains. But I want to, th- you mentioned something I really want our viewers to, uh, not uh, miss. And that is that you began noticing reduction <coughs> in your belly fat, even before you made your dietary changes, but just by working on stress, meditating and doing couples therapy. In other words, lowering the level of uh, inflammation in your body tended to help your body get rid of belly fat. That's, that's a powerful message. It is powerful. And I think a lot of people who have their food relatively dialed in don't appreciate the cost of stress. And, you know, the, one of the easiest ways of measuring the cost of stress is to look at your blood sugar. And even though I was relatively lean, I was at a body weight a little bit higher than where I am now. I had problems with my blood sugar. Wow. You know, not, not high enough that my primary care physician was saying, you know, we've got to give you a pill for this, but high enough that pretty consistently in the morning, my fasting blood sugar was 105, Whoa. 110. And, and that is very high in my opinion. I mean, Yes. Uh, there was an interesting study in the New England Journal of Medicine in September of 2013 that took a group of several thousand individuals and measured their fasting blood sugars and then followed them for 6.7 years. 
and found that those people who had blood sugars of 105 had a dramatic increased risk of developing dementia. So, you know, it challenges us to think about what's a normal value of something like blood sugar versus what's an ideal value. And I think we need a lot of work there. I mean, I think it's got to be a lot lower. Well, what do you like to use as an ideal value? Well, uh, now that I'm being interviewed, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think it's well beyond the fasting blood sugar day to day. I really think that people should pay a lot of attention to their A1C. You know, everybody's talking about A1C, who's diabetic. You see commercials on the TV for it. Um, but what a powerful marker of average blood sugar. And beyond that, it tells us the level of why blood sugar is bad because it measures a process called glycation. That is sugar binding to protein. That's what the A1C measures. And having said that, uh, it's that process, sugar binding to protein, that is so per powerfully correlated to amping up inflammation in the human body. So I like to keep people's uh, A1C at 5.3, 5.4. And I also think that the fasting insulin level is also really a, a very important guide to how well uh, the blood sugar is being controlled and how well we are managing insulin sensitivity. So as well as fructosamine, which is a lot like the A1C test, but it's a much shorter, it's two to three weeks in terms of the average blood sugar. So, uh, you know, the nice thing about the blood sugar is people can do it at home. They can do a finger stick and determine it as probably you did. But I think, you know, for a, a better picture, I like A1C, fructosamine, and fasting insulin as well. And where do you like the fasting insulin to be? I like it low. I mean, if it's five or six, I'm fine with that. I think that's mm -hmm. an indication that people are uh, more likely spending time in ketosis and much likely to, less likely to be you know focused on burning carbs and sugars as a calorie source so the the nice thing about keeping your fasting insulin level low is it dim it's clearly going to correlate with reduced risk for developing what is called insulin resistance whereas if your insulin level is high then ultimately your your cells start to get tired of it and say you know what i'm not going to pay any more attention to insulin i've had enough and that is obviously uh, what happens to pave the way for metabolic syndrome and even full-blown diabetes. So you then made this uh, dietary change. Tell us what that was like. What were, what were the changes that you made? At the time, I thought that what I was eating was very healthy. I had a fair amount of grains. I'd start the morning with oatmeal and some berries. I didn't have orange juice. <laughs> but I, I wasn't getting... I wasn't paying attention to my specific macronutrients in a way that I think became really informative. And I would have, you know, for lunch and dinner, I would grab some brown rice sushi from the local Whole Foods in between seeing patients. And for dinner, I would make quinoa pasta, as an example, with some tomato sauce and maybe some protein, meat of some type. And what I learned is that I don't do well with grains. I needed to go through a period of time of getting off of grains and that they were creating a fair amount of inflammation in my body. I have a genotype that does better with a low carbohydrate diet, not no carb. No carb is not good for me. I need more vegetables. So I started to eat one to two pounds of vegetables a day. And, um, I, I went to high school in Alaska, and so I went back to eating some of the foods that I ate in high school that served me really well, you know, a lot of um, cold water fish, such as wild-caught Alaskan salmon and halibut, and um, and that served me a lot better than, uh, you know, I had tried paleo for a while, and I actually found that I was gaining weight on paleo. I think it was just a little too much red meat for my system, and um and what I, what I ultimately learned through a lot of trial and error and trial and success is that I needed to focus on this particular issue of blood glucose. So um, glucose disposal and really figuring out, okay, what, what helps me stay within a pretty tight range with my blood sugar? Because as you know, that tends to go up as you get older. By age 50, it goes up by about 10 points. And so I, I really needed to dial that in. And I had some supplements that I took as well, such as berberine and um, more chromium and uh, vitamin D, of course. But I, I really think it's the food and the exercise that had the greatest impact. You know, there, there is a segment of, uh, of 
uh, our population, people who are, as you say, dialed in, who really don't say that, who really sort of downplay exercise saying really it's all about diet. And I think that diet is really very important, but um, I, you know, we now see research that indicates that aerobic exercise, for example, as a gene expression modulator, changes the expression of genes to turn on the, uh, a chemical production that actually grows new brain cells. We've also seen a data, and I've done a podcast on it, uh, looking at how aerobic exercise correlates with bacterial diversity in the gut microbiome. So, yeah, you can lose weight if you want to by changing your diet. Uh, but again, there are other very positive things I think that aerobics uh, and other forms of exercise, resistance exercise, are doing for a person. So I really am glad you didn't downplay that. That's really important. And I want to call our t viewers' attention to a recent um, interview I did with Nora Ged Gaudis, whose story is actually very similar. She also went to Alaska and began eating uh, cold water fish high in DHA and omega-3s and uh, had a similar experience, began losing weight. So now you have a bit of a um, uh, experiential phenomenon here. You're regaining weight, uh, your uh, health rather, and um, based on your dietary change, what happened then? Well, the exercise was big, and I, I, I want to just uh, call attention to one piece that was, I think, very important here, and that is when I was 44, I was seeing patients for about eight to 10 hours a day, at least four days a week, and I was sitting a lot. Mm. I, I think that was a big part of the inflammation that I had. And, you know, there's some recent data showing that you can't undo that level of sitting by just going to the gym for an hour. So what I, I, I changed the way that I see patients. Um, I started to work, you know, I write more now than I, I did then, but I, I work at a treadmill desk. And I got, you know, what the data shows is that ideally you want to sit for three hours or less per day, or at least get up and walk around and move your body. I, I should get up right get now. Stuck. I'm sitting, but then you I know, realize I'm wearing stand. shorts. <laughs> <laughs> I am. And no shoes or socks. But that said, so that's really, uh, that's really kind of uh, interesting that, that that came to you. And we as physicians spend a lot of time sitting, and there are a lot of books written uh, about this. Here's... Uh, Dr. Uh, Kelly Sturette wrote this book. I've been, and we just yes. did an interview of him, Dustbound. I don't know if that's showing up really well, but uh, love you're right. Uh, you really got to get up and, and get moving. And it's hard to offset eight hours of sitting by thinking uh, your one hour in the gym is going to do that. So, what a great uh, piece of information. It was yeah. a huge aha moment, and and there's longevity data to show the benefit. You know, it sort of fits intuitively. You know that no you question. will live longer and, you know, if you sit less. Everybody's looking at the blue zones, asking, well, what are the people of the blue zones eating? Okay, well, actually, their diets are somewhat varied, comparing one blue zone to the next. But two things I think are overriding that are um, very similar amongst the populations, and that is number one, a, a huge degree of social engagement, and second, that these people are active. Even uh, you know, octogenarians, nonagenarians, and centenarians are moving around still, and that's so uh, underrated, I think, in our society. Totally agree. I, you know, I really looked at the Icarians um, as part of my uh, research for this book. It was a blue zone that I was really curious about because they um, they eat a ton of greens and they eat a lot of legumes and. Um, and they live in kind of this hilly island where they're up and down all the time on their mountainous areas. And I, I, um, I really took that to heart because I think a lot of the people that I know that are really vibrant and healthy at 80, 90, and 100 are super active. And there was even a woman that I saw on Facebook, Ida Keeling, who had become a runner in her 60s. And she is... She's one of the record holders for the 100-meter dash, and I just love that she's still sprinting. I think that a lot of the aging process begins in the muscles, and we need to address that. It's something that's totally preventable. I, I, I would agree with you. And I, I think that in addition, though, looking at just being mobile and active in terms of an epigenetic event is really very powerful. So later on in your book, you uh, developed various uh, programs and make various recommendations. And so 
Have you incorporated, this is really how you're practicing medicine now, isn't it? It is how I'm practicing medicine. I mean, I, I sort of started off my medical career as a conventional OBGYN, and then I, I took a turn toward doing more natural hormone balance. But I, you know, I feel like my own challenges and the challenges that come up among my patients have guided me in other directions. And, um, you know, hormone balance is still an important part of the work that I do. But epigenetics is such a profound opportunity and I think it's important that we focus our energy there. What a cool notion um, that you can tell women that, you know, that their genes are not hardwired. I mean, you mentioned that you have um, fat genes. We're not talking about Levi's. We're talking about inheritance here. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, 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 as my viewers know, uh, have a, a, a risk for Alzheimer's based upon my pedigree. But that we can rewrite our genetic destiny. And... What your book, Younger, is really all about is empowering women with the actual tools day to day to rewrite their health destiny based upon changing their DNA expression. It's, it's you know, we've been talking about this for maybe a decade. It's still, it's breathtaking, isn't it? It is breathtaking. I and mean, we can even get specific about how large an effect it is. You know, I think... Um, most of the data shows that you can have a 50 to 90% change in the way that genes are expressed with lifestyle changes, with the environment that you create with your choices. So that, well, that is just a profound. I usually use 70% uh, uh, of our genes that code for health and longevity are under our direct control. So I guess I, luckily I'm in the ballpark as far as you're concerned. Yeah. You're right so, in the middle, yes. There is a push uh, for person, this notion of personalized medicine. In other words, cultivating supplements, diet, levels of exercise, and even to some degree pharmaceuticals based upon information that we as physicians are able to gain about our patients through very sophisticated testing. But shy having all patients undergo genetic and metabolomic uh, evaluation um, what are the broad strokes that you're able to tell us today that are generally good ideas and make sense? Well, the good news is, you know, many of these recommendations line up with what we've heard before, and we can talk about, you know, what, what some of the novel ideas are. But um, many of these things that I found were so um, impactful for myself are also impactful for others. So starting with your food, getting your food dialed in with the focus, especially on glucose disposal. So what's going on with your blood sugar? How do you really manage that in a way that maybe you haven't before? I think a lot of people are kind of casual about it. They go to their doctor, their blood sugar is 100 or 105 fasting, and they don't do much about it. Or their hemoglobin A1C is 5.8 and they just kind of blow it off. But I really want you to pay attention to this. You go to your doctor, your hemoglobin A1C is 5.8, and your doctor gives you a pat on the back and says, right. <laughs> don't worry about it, you're not diabetic, with the word yet hanging in the air. So what do you tell totally. this person now? Where do we go with this information? We got a hemoglobin A1C of 5.8, fasting blood sugar is 105, in, fasting insulin, let's say, is 12 to 14. What are you gonna tell that person? Well, I think there's a lot of value in testing for people who are open to testing at home, getting a $20 glucose meter where you prick your finger and measure your fasting blood sugar in the morning and maybe two hour postprandial after a meal. That can give you a lot of information about where your problems are. Um, as you mentioned, the hemoglobin A1C is an average over about three months. So I think there's value to getting that daily information and some feedback, but I would give yourself at least seven weeks to follow my protocol or follow a protocol that's pretty similar to what I have where you are making your muscles hungry through exercise, through very specific types of exercise like burst training, high intensity interval training, um, managing stress. I have a whole chapter on that since that was such a big part of my um, aha moment with my telomeres. And, and choosing foods that are not going to make your blood sugar go up too high and then crash back down. So that means we should talk about that. So making sure that you're getting adequate fat. 
So and let's talk first I'm, about the, the villains. Uh, what's going to be the worst thing a person can do in terms of their blood sugar regulation? A lot of villains come to mind. I would say eating sugar, eating, you know, ice cream with sugar, eating cookies, eating um, kind of a flour uh, sugar combination that acts like a bomb when it comes to the way that your cells are sensitive to insulin. Um, so I think that that's one of the worst problems. What do you think is the top villain? Uh, I would say, I would say sugar. And the problem is, um, I think the hidden sources of sugar that people don't recognize. You mentioned orange juice a, a while ago that a 12 ounce glass of orange juice has nine teaspoons of sugar, 36 grams of carbohydrate. People need to know that. Uh, I did a magazine interview this morning and with one of the local uh, splashy magazines and they wanted to know what is a good breakfast versus, um, you know, a, a typical breakfast. We went to a restaurant. This is a truth. It just happened two hours ago. And the woman interviewing me ordered, um, chicken, fried chicken, but it was, <laughs> I'm not making this up, it was sandwiched between two waffles with uh, very, oh um, you know, very highly refined grain, made the waffles. And then they brought her about a half a cup of maple syrup. And oh my gosh. I, you talk about spiking your blood sugar. And the interviewer uh, was looking at this and it, she really did order that breakfast, I think, to serve as a contrast to my two egg omelet with spinach and feta cheese with olive oil and a side order of sauteed spinach as well. That said, um, we were kidding around. I said, what do you think is in that container that they say is maple syrup? And she said, well, I think it's maple syrup. I said, well, let's ask the waitress. And I said to the waitress, what I asked her, what is in that? She said, oh, that's maple syrup. I said, oh, really? Then the hostess walked by and I said to the hostess, can you tell me what's that? She said, oh, that's maple syrup. And then finally the chef came out knowing that we were doing this interview and I said, what is that? And he said, oh, maple syrup. So I said, wow, that's terrific. Can we, can we look at the bottle? And they brought us the bottle, a one gallon bottle of um, I, it was log cabin. And the only thing that related to the maple tree was that there were little maple trees in the snow <laughs> on the label. And it said, it was interesting, on the bottom it said, no high fructose corn syrup. Well, that's great. We flip it over and look at the ingredients. And the number one ingredient was corn syrup. Well, it wasn't high fructose corn syrup because it wasn't 52% uh, fructose or higher, so it wasn't modified, but it was still corn syrup. So, you know, again, caveat emptor, let the buyer be well aware. That is what, you know, your work is about. It's things are not as they seem. And even if it's 100% pure maple syrup, that doesn't give you license. It's still sugar. And so, you know, the point is there's all these hidden sources of refined carbs that people don't even recognize. My next villain, I think, is the absence of uh, adequate fiber and the absence of good fat in, in the diet, which I think the fiber part especially is so prevalent in America. I mean, people just don't eat um, those vegetable sources of, of fiber anymore. And it's really not just in terms of digesting, but in terms of the health of the microbiome. I think that's really leading to diabetes and obesity just because of the changes that are happening in the gut bacteria. Yeah, so, I totally agree. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, really excited about your book, and maybe there's a graphic of your uh, book appearing on the screen right now. There it is, <laughs> and it's it's a terrific graphic. You look terrific on the cover, by the way. Thank you. And thank I think you. you look even better when you read the introduction and the the narrative about you and your. I'm going to say struggle a little bit because uh, you turned the uh, lemons into lemonade without sugar. Uh, how you really took mm -hmm. this um, lessons in, in life, not just in terms of how you were feeling, how you looked, but also your testing and, and you really made the best of it. And once you learned all this stuff, what a beautiful thing that you decided to share it with all the rest of us. So that's terrific. Well, thank you for that. I, you know, one thing I've learned from the challenges that I've had with my health with, you know, much more than just a struggle with my weight, you know, it's it's been a battle for a lot of my life and no longer is. I changed my mindset around this, that it's not, these are not things that happened to me. I'm not a victim of my situation with my telomeres. These are things that happened for me. And I think that shift, you know, didn't happen to me. These happened for me. 
it's something that I really invite our listeners to consider in their own lives. Like we have these opportunities that come up and we need to take them. Yeah, I mean, you you can't change the hardwiring message uh, that you've been given, the blueprint from your ancestors, but you are changing moment to moment the expression of those instructions, turning instructions on and turning instructions off. And what a powerful no notion it is that a, a more ketogenic diet actually sends powerful messages to the a genome to uh, increase the production of a chemical to, to grow new brain cells and at the same time reduce the activity of what is called the inflammasome or the, the aggregate parts of your machinery that increase inflammation, the cornerstone of obesity, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, coronary artery disease, and just about you know everything else bad you don't want to get. So congratulations on this uh, new book. I am certain it's going to be a home run uh, like your other books have been and you know, I've said this before uh, many times that the word doctor doesn't mean healer, it means teacher, and you're doing such a great job. Tell us a little bit about your, um, you have a virtual kind of a, an, a way that people interact with you as well uh, when they're not able to see you in the office. How do we, do, how do people do that? Well, the best way is to go to sarahgottfriedmd.com. It's where we have a lot of our online courses and other, you know, free things that people can be involved in. And it, you know, one thing that's very important to me is to be evidence-based about all of the work that we do in functional medicine. And when I come up with a protocol, such as how to slow down the aging process and improve your epigenetics, it's not something that's just my good ideas. It's based on a pretty exhaustive literature search. I'm usually reading about 2,500 articles per book. And then once I create a functional medicine protocol, I test it. So... That's a part of our virtual community that we will be testing the protocols that go along with each of my books. We ran the Younger Protocol in a group of a thousand and found that they they added about 10 years to their health span, that period of time that you live without disease. So um, they also lost inches of their waist and had some of the other outcomes that I had. So uh, you know, we continue to offer this programming with me uh, kind of leading the course and offering um, Q&A sessions to really make sure that it gets personalized and tailored to the individual. Uh, in my new book, I, I talk about one of the pillars of health uh, that became evident to me is expression of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that I am expressing a lot of gratitude towards you and your work because it's helping a lot of people and I'm just grateful that you're out there doing what you're doing. So kudos to you. Thank you. It's and the same back to you. I'm so grateful for your work. I love that it is far and wide. I just was in uh, Norway, and you are you're like a rock star in Norway. They love you so much there. <laughs> oh, they eat a lot of cold water fish, so they're doing everything right. So exactly thank you right. so much, and I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Maybe we'll see each other in June for the IFM conference. Who knows? I hope so. Thank you oh. so much, Dr. Okay. Perlmutter. Bye, Sarah. Thank you. I sure enjoyed talking today to Sarah Gottfried. Uh, here is a woman who has a very extensive uh, outreach to people, uh, giving them very important information, speaking not only as a scientist having done the research, but really leveraging a lot of her own personal experience that led to very, very positive results. And these are results that can be very helpful uh, for you as well. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Bye-bye.